Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Heilman from Carleton University, and I am the regional coordinator for this part of the 2023 CAP Lecture Tour. We respectfully acknowledge that Trent University is located on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to First Peoples for their care, for their teachings, and for, and for their teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings here today. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our host for today's capture lecture talk tour, tour, tour talk, sorry, <laughs> Professor Aaron Slepkov, Chair of the Physics and Astronomy Department at Trent University, who will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you, Jesse. Welcome everyone to this third talk in the CAP Lecture Tour Series for 2023. I'm Aaron Slepkov, and I'm pleased to host this talk from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Trent University. We welcome the audience that is participating both in person here at the university and those who are joining us virtually. This event is being recorded to be made available for later viewing on the CAPS YouTube channel. The lecture tour series is sponsored by the CAP Foundation and the Canadian Association of Physicists. We're a national network of about 1700 physicists working at universities, companies, and research institutions across Canada. The CAP works on behalf of Canadian physicists to support physics education research and sponsor a number of physics activities, including national research conferences and this lecture tour. The CAP also delivers a number of programs for undergraduate and graduate students, research conferences, physics scholarships and prizes, and a student advisory council. If you've not already joined CAP, please consider becoming part of Canada's largest network of physicists and physics students. It's free for undergraduate students and for the first year of membership for graduate students as well. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Stephanie Tishek from the University of Ottawa. Dr. Tishek's research interests focus on the intersection of artificial neural networks and quantum technologies with a specific focus on the realization of neural networks on biologically inspired neuromorphic devices or general physics systems. Today, Dr. Tishek will present her talk entitled Neuromorphic Hardware and its Role in Quantum Technologies. Welcome, Steph. Thanks a lot for hosting me here today at Trent University. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm happy to see the audience in person and also to see that quite a lot of people are joining online. And so about myself, so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa and I just joined the University of Ottawa very recently. So basically I started in July last year and uh, I'm now growing my research team in Ottawa focusing on artificial neural networks and also neuromorphic computing to advance quantum technologies. I'm just Seeing that something is happening with my presentation. Okay, that is better. So today I will uh, give you an overview of my research interests and hopefully give you an idea about um, what my group is working on. And so the entire uh, motivation for the field of research that I'm looking into is driven by the fact that uh, our current computing architectures. So I was talking about our, uh, the motivation for our field of research about uh, classical computers reaching the limitations. And when I'm talking about classical computers, I'm referring to our conventional laptops that yeah, we are using pretty much daily, let's say this, during the last two years. And these laptops are basically based, uh, built up on the so-called von Neumann architecture, where you have your computational units or your CPU, you have your memory, and you always have to transfer information between the different uh, devices. And these laptops or these conventional computers, well, on the one hand, they are really powerful. They are very general. We know that we can do pretty much anything we want with our computers. But we also have uh, realized over the last years that these devices are reaching their limitations, meaning it is not possible to efficiently scale up the memory or also the computation power any further. And now if we look at very specific applications, for example, in the field of AI, or also if we uh, simulate our quantum systems, we easily realize that these devices really reach their limitations and we wouldn't need larger supercomputers to really um, get, achieve what we want to do. And driven by these uh, limitations, people started to develop alternative computing architectures. And one very famous example are quantum computers. And I'm pretty sure every one of you has heard about quantum computers. So the idea is that we have these uh, so-called qubits or basically quantum systems that we can prepare in different states. We can act on them uh, with unitary transformations. And uh, based on this, we can perform different kinds of computations. And theoretically, it has been shown that these quantum computers are extremely powerful. So they can do really powerful tasks. They can definitely overcome these limitations of our conventional computers or our classical computers. Uh, but well, the experimental realizations are still extremely limited and under development. So 
theoretically, we know these quantum computers are really cool, but experimentally, we don't really have a, like a full uh, quantum computer that we can use to perform all these tasks to overcome the classical limitations. Another example of alternative computing architect architectures are, are so-called neuromorphic computing, which is unfortunately less well known to the public. But the idea here is that people are developing devices which are inspired by the behavior of the human or the biological brain. And so why do we actually, why do we have this motivation to build a device which is inspired by the brain? Uh, if we think about, or we, if we take a step back and think about the more uh, bigger picture. Yeah, if we take a step back, then we know that pretty much daily we use artificial intelligence, which is often based on so-called artificial neural networks. I guess you use it way more often than you would think during your everyday life. And these artificial neural networks, as the name suggests, they initially have been inspired kind of by the setup of the biological brain. But over the time, they have uh, their setup and their architectures have evolved pretty far away from the biological model. And on the one hand, this is really good because all these uh, developments have, been, or, yeah, have happened because, uh, with the motivation to optimize the computational efficiency on our conventional uh, classical machines. And this is really great because only due to these developments, we are now able to really use these artificial neural networks. And just as a side note, uh, three people who yeah, significantly contributed to all these developments of artificial neural networks and the development of deep learning and all these powers that we now make use of uh, are these three Canadian uh, people here. So Joshua Bengio, Jeff Hinton, and Jan LeCun have contributed quite a lot to all these developments. Uh, so this is amazing, but at the same time, by going far, farther away from the biological uh, model of the brain, we also lose some benefits or some properties that biological brains have. Namely, if we think about it, it doesn't always feel like it, but our brain is extremely fast. So I can show you a picture for just a few microseconds and you can recognize the picture, you can remember it. Uh, so this is much faster than what artificial intelligence can do. Uh, it's also extremely energy efficient. So the energy your brain can consume is upper limited by the amount of food you eat, obviously. But if you compare this to the energy consumption of these huge supercomputers that run artificial neural networks, this is just a really tiny amount of energy. Uh, similarly, if we think about the size of our brain and the size of current supercomputers, our brain is extremely small. And so we lose all these benefits if we go to these artificial neural networks and to these um, models that run efficiently on our uh, conventional computers. Uh, and this motivated people to kind of develop so-called neuromorphic uh, computing, neuromorphic devices. Uh, and there exist different kinds of neuromorphic devices. And But the motivation behind all of them is kind of trying to get all these nice uh, benefits of biological brains or biological models uh, into the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, two famous examples of neuromorphic devices are so-called spiking neuromorphic devices and like the matrix multiplication accelerators. So spiking neuromorphic devices are literally uh, built with the motivation to emulate a human brain. So this picture here is from the BrainScape chip, which is developed at Heidelberg University. Um, two different other famous examples are Spinnaker or Intel Suihi, who are building these devices. And these are electronic circuits that uh, realize or that mimic uh, signal driven neurons, biological neurons in these electronic circuits, which are then connected via digital synapses. So they can uh, exchange information via these digital connections. So this is pretty close to the biological brain, but at the same time, it's pretty far away from these artificial neural network models meaning that we cannot just take our very well-developed algorithms from artificial neural networks and run them on the spiking neuromorphic hardware because it's just a totally different setup. So we have to come up with new algorithms to efficiently use spiking neuromorphic devices. On the other hand, we have uh, these spectrum matrix multiplication accelerators. They are pretty different. So they are really analog devices um, that perform vector matrix multiplication. This is an example of a device that is uh, developed at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. And here, this is kind of the other way around than the spiking hardware. So we have the analog vector matrix multiplication, uh, which is connected to digital implementations of neurons. And so with this, these vector matrix multi multiplication accelerators are closer to artificial neural network models, meaning that we can just use them and run our well-known algorithms on this hardware. But at the same time, we are further away from the biological brain. So you can kind of go uh, or you can choose the amount of um, biological uh, simulation you want to have. And so why am I telling you all this? So this is all about neuromorphic computing. I myself, I'm a quantum physicist. So why am I excited about neuromorphic computing? So my motivation is uh, based on 
uh, quite a lot of works that came out uh, during the last years where people use artificial neural networks in the field of quantum technologies. And again, two people who significantly contributed to this field and who are still driving it forward are uh, Roger Melko and Juan Carlos Kia, who are from Waterloo and Toronto, uh, respectively. And uh, they have done a lot. They have developed a lot of algorithms to use artificial neural networks to study and also to advance uh, quantum systems. And so my motivation is to see if we can use this neuromorphic hardware to further advance the field of quantum technologies. And the idea here is that if we use these algorithms that are very well developed and we kind of combine them with uh, spiking or with generally neuromorphic hardware, then on the one hand, we can implement them on these very small and energy efficient chips, which ideally can be uh, integrated in ex experimental setups. So close to the experiment, reducing the amount of information transfer to external computers. And at the same time, I told you for these spiking neuromorphic devices, we have to come up with new algorithms so we also hope that we can find different algorithms that can overcome the limitations of what we are doing now with these artificial neural networks. So this is kind of the motivation or the, the big picture uh, for, of the research that I'm doing. And now that I've motivated it, let me start with getting into the different topics uh, in more detail. I will address each topic individually and then show you how they uh, get together and how they combine. So let me start with talking a bit more about quantum computation and quantum simulation. So I think you all heard a lot about quantum computing. So what is this all about? So if we go back and we look again at our classical computer, so just our laptop, then you probably know that everything you do on your laptop is based on Docker bits. So we have these elements which can take two states. They can be zero or one. And everything you do, every video you watch, every game you play is just based on computations performed with these two bits. Uh, similarly, quantum computers are based on quantum bits or qubits as we call them. And they are pretty similar to classical bits, so they also can take two states, but they also show quantum mechanical effects. And one very famous uh, quantum mechanical effect is superposition, which is often illustrated with uh, Schrodinger's cat example. Uh, so I guess all of you have heard about it. So the idea is that we have a cat, we put it into a box, and together with a cat, we put into a box, uh, into the box, um, some bottle with a, with a poison and some radioactive material. And whenever an atom decays, um, this hammer is set free to uh, destroy the bottle with poison, the cat gets poisoned and dies. And so the idea is that if we put everything into the box, and we close the box, we don't know if the cat is dead or alive because we don't know if an atom has decayed yet or not, or not. And so at this time, as long as we don't open the box, the cat is at the same time dead and alive. And this is similarly true for our quantum bits. So they can take two states, they can be zero or one, but they can also be in any kind of superposition of zero or one. So for example here, they are in the equal superposition uh, of the zero and the one state. And as soon as we, so this is similar to Schrodinger's cat. And now you know that as soon as we open the box with Schrodinger's cat in it, uh, we know immediately um, if the cat is dead or alive by just looking at it. So this is again similar in our quantum bits. So as soon as we measure our bit, we know that, or we find it in either the zero or the one state. But we have kind of, uh, so we, we have destroyed the superposition. It is now in exactly one of these two states. And we can find each of the two states with a different probability. So again, if we look at this example of Schrodinger's cat, right after we close the box, we have a very high probability that if we open it right away, the cat is still alive. If we wait for a couple of weeks, no matter if, if an atom has decayed or not, we are pretty sure the cat has died in the meantime. Okay, and so we can kind of change the, the probability with which we get each of the two possible measurement outcomes. And this is similar for our qubits. So in this example, we would have an equal probability of measuring zero or one, but we can also have a higher probability to measure the zero state or the one state respectively. So this is one uh, very nice uh, feature of uh, qubits. And this is extremely powerful if we think about parallelization tasks. So you can imagine that if we have all these states existing in parallel, we can perform parallelized uh, tasks or computations very efficiently with our quantum computers. Uh, another very nice quantum effect is so-called entanglement. So the current Nobel Prize, uh, which was given in 2022, uh, it went to Alan Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Feilinger for their research on entanglement. And this is another word that often appears. So what is actually meant with entanglement? So if we look at just two, uh, two particles or two qubits, then I said we can prepare them in superpositions of states. But for example, we can prepare them in this uh, state here. So we have the superposition of both uh, qubits being in the zero state or both 
qubits being in the warm state. There's a zero probability that we find them in different states. So the probability for finding them in zero one or one zero is zero. And, um, and with this, once we measure one of the qubits, we know exactly what state the other qubit is in without even measuring it. And so this is what we call uh, entanglement. And then uh, there's this nice thing that you can delocalize these qubits. So you can send them to different locations anywhere on the earth. And actually Anton Salinger has done this experiment so he went to the Canary Islands, he prepared two photons, two entangled photons, and he sent one of the photons to a different island, which was, I think, about 200 kilometers away. And he was able to prove that they were still entangled, meaning that he had this one uh, photon on one of the islands, he measured it in the zero state, and the other photon on the different island was in the zero state as well, and similarly for the one state. And so you can, send, you can uh, send these uh, qubits to different places on the Earth, and they are still entangled, which means you can instantly exchange information uh, between two different places. And so this is a really nice and powerful uh, feature of qubits. So again, it helps to uh, transport information over long distances. And it is the basic principle underlying the field of quantum commu communication and also quantum cryptography. Okay, so this is, these are kind of the effects which make quantum computers or qubits so, more pow so, more, so powerful and so much better than classical bits. But let's take a closer look at what qubits actually are and how we can uh, use them. So if we look at a qubit system, we always study it um, by looking at the so-called Hilbert space, which is just the space of all possible configurations of the qubit. So for a single qubit, we have uh, two elements in the Hilbert space. We have our qubit, which can be in a zero or one state, or I'm depicting it as up and down state here. But now if we look at two qubits, then we already have four elements in our Hilbert space because now each qubit can be in the zero uh, state or the one state, which gives us four possible combinations. And now you can do the math and you can increase the system size. And what you will find is that if we look at a general system of n qubits, we have two to the n possible configurations of each qubit being in the zero or in the one state. So our Hilbert space has a dimension of two to the n, showing us that the Hilbert space dimension scales exponentially with the system size. And now if we want to exactly study these systems, we need to take all these two to the end states into the account because our state is always a superposition of these exponentially many states. And this is what people call the curse of dimensionality. So the uh, dimension of the space that we need to study scales exponentially with the system size. Uh, I personally find that this is a very unfortunate expression uh, because I mean, of course it limits our theoretical studies our exact studies of this model. But at the same time, once we are able to control these qubit systems, these exponentially scaling system sizes, um, this is extremely powerful. And so this is kind of the idea uh, behind quantum computation and quantum simulation. We need to learn how to control these qubit systems. And once we are able to control them, we can make use of it and it's extremely cool. Um, but at the same time, it's pretty hard to control them, which is why we are currently in the so-called NISC era, meaning we have noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. So noisy meaning that we have a bunch of qubits that can be realized and you can access them. So there are some cloud computers or cloud quantum computers that you can access. They have a couple of hundred qubits usually, but they are all still noisy. So they are not really accurate. And again, if we talk about a couple of hundred qubits, but this is not a small system size, it's, it's quite big actually, but compared to our bits and our classical computers, this is still pretty small, which is why people call it the intermediate scale quantum era. Okay, so we have these quantum computers, they are kind of realized, but they are still very limited, so we cannot really make use of them. And this is why we need to better understand how these qubit systems behave, how they work, and how we can control them. And we do this by looking at them with theoretical studies. And if we cannot simulate them or study them exactly, what we can do is we can use our classical computer and we can look at approximative simulation methods. And um, Three famous examples of these uh, approximative simulation methods are tensor network methods or matrix product states, uh, quantum Monte Carlo methods, and one very recent uh, method that I will talk about more uh, later during the talk, which are these neural network quantum states. So I don't have time to go into the details of all these methods, but the underlying principle of all of them is that apparently we don't really need to look at all these exponentially many states in our Hilbert space but we can rather focus on a subset of states, which are the so-called physical states. And these are the states that uh, dominate the behavior of uh, our uh, qubit system. Meaning that we can look at this system and just by only modeling the physical states, the subset, 
we get a pretty accurate approximation of our qubit system. And so we have now shifted the task from solving this exponentially scaling problem towards finding the subset of physical states. And once we have the subset, we are pretty good. We can just model our uh, system. So how can we find this subset of physical states? So the idea is that we look at the weight function. For those of you who have, who have uh, taken quantum mechanics classes, uh, the weight function is the object that you use to describe your quantum state. And we can look at this square wave function amplitude, which is kind of a probability distribution underlying all possible basis states, meaning all states or all possible configurations of each qubit being in the zero or in the one state. And since this is a probability distribution, we know that uh, the physical states are the states with high probabilities, so with large squared wave function amplitudes, because these uh, contribute most to the behavior of our quantum system. And so what we need to do now is we need to find a numerical expression of our squared wave function amplitude. Once we have found this expression, we can just sample from this probability distribution. And these samples will automatically be the physical states because we have a higher probability to sample these states with a large uh, squared wave function amplitude. And so the only problem we need to solve now is we need to find this numerical expression for the squared wave function amplitude. And we need to find an efficient way how to draw samples from it. And this is where the neural networks will come in in a minute. But before I show you how they come in, let me introduce artificial neural networks in a little more detail and give you an idea of how they work. And so I'm pretty sure everyone has heard about AI, artificial neural networks, and that you use them in your everyday life. So your phone is, has quite a lot of applications that use artificial intelligence. Um, but artificial intelligence actually cannot do this any kind of task. It can do very specific tasks very efficiently and very in a very powerful manner. And uh, very, uh, all the famous examples or example applications are on one hand image classification. So we can take an image and we can ask our neural network to tell us what kind of animal or what kind of object is in the image. Uh, you use this uh, if you drive in your car and you have this um, system which can detect uh, street signs. This is exactly such a neural network uh, classifying an image and detecting the street sign in the, in the video. Uh, another famous example is text prediction. So we can use, or you use it pretty much uh, daily when you type a message on your phone and you have this prediction of the next word. Uh, this is again an artificial neural network looking or getting as an input all the way, uh, words that you have already typed and then predicting as an output the next word with, uh, which has the highest probability to appear. Uh, similarly, you can not only generate text, you can also generate images. So these images are from this website, this cat does not exist. So this is an AI generating images of cats and you can compare it to this image up here. This is my cat, so this one does exist, but you barely see the difference, right? So these, uh, these AIs are really powerful. They can generate these images. There's also a website called this person does not exist, which is even more impressive. So this looks really good. And you see that artificial neural networks are really powerful and they can do a lot of stuff. But how do they actually do it? So let's take a closer look at this image classification example. So you might have heard that artificial neural networks are set up of these different kinds of layers and each layer contains a set of neurons and we have different kinds of neurons. So in this first layer, in the so-called input layer, we have input neurons. And these are just real numbers, meaning that we take each pixel of our image that we want to classify and we encode it in a real number. So meaning we encode the position and the, or maybe not the position, but the uh, color and uh, yeah, the RGB values and so on. Um, then we propagate this signal through our network into the next layer. And here we have the so-called hidden layer, which, are the, or which consists of hidden neurons. And these are basically nonlinear transformations of the input that they, or of the signal that they receive. So what they do is they take the input signal. So VI was the value of our uh, input neuron and they multiply each, uh, each signal or the value of each input neuron with some number. So W is again, a, a real valued number. And this is the so-called connecting weight. And then what happens is we sum over all neurons in the previous layer. So in this example, over all neurons in the uh, input layer, we multiply each term with this connecting weight and then we apply a nonlinear transformation function to this sum of uh, signals. Okay, and so this gives us again a real number, but we have a nonlinear transformation of all the uh, input values. And then we can continue like this. So if we talk about deep neural networks, then this means we have even more hidden layers here. So we can add the same kind of layer uh, behind this layer multiple times. 
we can have multiple hidden uh, hidden layers with sets of hidden neurons, and all of them perform nonlinear transformations. And then at some point we reach this output layer here. So we have these output neurons. They are pretty similar to the hidden neurons. So again, they uh, take as an input the sum over all uh, values of the neurons in the previous layer, weighted with some connecting weights, and then they apply some nonlinear activation function. And here we now use the so-called sigmoid function as an activation function. Uh, I plotted it down here. So it just basically takes any kind of value between zero and one. And now if we assume we normalize our output neurons so that their values always sum up to one, then, this, then we can interpret this as a probability distribution underlying all the different output neurons. And if we then um, associate each uh, output neuron with one task, so in this example, with one kind of animal, then this gives us a probability for finding the corresponding animal in the input image. Okay. So this is how image classification works. It's all, it's all about probabilities, it's all about telling you what is the, or what, what kind of animal or object has the highest probability to be in this uh, input image. And so this is how the neural network works. But now, of course, if I give you this neural network, which can detect animals, it cannot detect uh, street signs. So we have to kind of train the neural network. So it has to learn, we have to teach it what it should detect in these different kinds of uh, images. And this is done by so this so-called uh, network training. And here we use these connecting weights, so the Ws, um, as variation parameters. And we tune these Ws such that we get a desired output. So basically, the way it works is we have a huge data set with images of different animals and the correct labels. And we uh, send these images into the neural network. And then we tune these uh, variation parameters to optimize the accuracy uh, for the output of our neural network. So this is how the network is trained, and this is how we can classify images. Now let me move on to the next example, which was the text prediction example. Um, here we use so-called recurrent neural networks, which yeah, the, the very basic version of them has the similar setup as our um, neural networks that we saw before. So we can have one input uh, layer, then we have uh, a hidden layer, and we have an output layer. But now if we have text prediction, we need some kind of memory effect. Because if we predict the next word, we don't want this prediction only to depend on the previous word, but to depend on all the previous words in the entire uh, sentence or the sequence of words that you have typed before. And so we need some kind of memory effect. And this memory effect is generated by passing the, hit, the state of all these hidden neurons as another input in the next iteration. So the way it works is we send a sequence of words as an input to the network sequentially. And uh, every, for every element of the sequence, we also send as an input of uh, the state of the hidden neuron. So we propagate the hidden state over the entire sequence. And with this, we generate kind of a memory effect. What we get as an output then is probability for different words that, um, that can appear as the next word from which we can then sample the next word. And again, now we want this probability not to be just some independent probability, but we want it to be a probability which depends on all previous words in our sequence that we have typed before. And so these output probabilities are probabilities of the next word given or conditioned on the words that we have previously entered in our sequence. So basically the words that we have previously used as an input to our neural networks. Okay, so all these uh, probabilities up here are conditional probabilities, and then we can sample the next word of our sequence and we can predict the next word. Uh, we can also extract the probability distribution underlying the full sequence of words then, or the, the full sentence um, that we have typed. And this is just given by taking the product over all elements in the sequence and looking at the um, conditional probabilities. Okay. And so now what we can do is we have a neural network which can uh, sequentially predict the next word. So basically what happens, we have a neural network that encodes a probability distribution, this distribution. And we can generate samples from it efficiently. And now if you think back what I told you earlier when we talked about uh, simulating quantum states, this is exactly what we need, right? So we need some numerical model which can represent a probability distribution and we can efficiently draw samples from it. And so this is what we do exactly when we use artificial neural networks to simulate quantum states. So I told you we have the Hilbert space, we need to find the subset of physical states. And we do this by uh, finding the square wave function amplitude and drawing samples from it. And so now we use our recurrent neural networks. And as an input of our sequence, we now use the qubits in our system. 
So we sequentially send in the states of the, the individual qubits in our uh, qubit chain. And what we get as an output is the probability for the next qubit in the chain to be either up or down. And then we can sample the next uh, qubit state from this probability. And now we want to train our neural network such that the probability distribution encoded in this recurrent neural network equals this or approximates the squared wave function amplitude, right? And so once we have done this, we, uh, we have a representation of our quantum state in a very efficient manner on our classical computer, and we can draw samples from it. And this, these samples approximate our physical states of our quantum system, so we can efficiently study our system. So this is the basic idea or the, yeah, very rough explanation of the basic idea of how we can represent quantum states with neural networks. One thing I have not talked about yet is how we train these networks. So we somehow have to teach the network what this squared wave function amplitude is so that we can encode it and draw samples from it. And to do this, there exist two different strategies. So let me give you the brief idea of uh, yeah, what these strategies are. Uh, one is so-called data-driven training. So here we just assume we have some kind of quantum experiment. So I'm a theoretician. I don't know what is going on in this quantum experiment. I just assume some experimental physicists have a black box which can prepare some qubit state for me. And the only way I can access this qubit state is via projective measurements. So I can read out each, uh, the configuration of each qubit, whether it is in the up or in the down state. And uh, once I have read out this qubit state, my quantum state has been destroyed. So it has to be re-prepared in order to perform the next measurement and so on. But if I assume I can perform a couple of these measurements, then I can collect the measurement outcomes in this measurement data set here. And all these outcomes follow some probability distribution, which we call PD here. And now we can train our neural network such that the, the distribution encoded in the network approximates the distribution underlying our measurement data set. And once we have done this, we know that if we generate more data, so if we sample from our recurrent neural network, then this data follows the same distribution as the measurement data set. So we kind of have a classical approximation of our experimentally prepared quantum state, meaning that we can generate efficiently more data um, uh, following the same distribution as the measurement outcome from the experiment. Uh, the second approach, how we can train the network, if we assume we don't have an ex uh, experimental setup, but we are only given some Hamiltonian, we can train the network with so-called Hamiltonian-driven training, where the idea is that we want to find a representation of the ground state of a given Hamiltonian. The ground state is always the state with the lowest energy expectation value. So what we do is we evaluate this energy expectation value, which is just the sandwich of the Hamiltonian operator with the wave function from both sides. And there exists a way how we can um, efficiently evaluate this energy expectation value using samples from our recurrent neural network, which we interpret as representing this uh, wave function amplitude. And so uh, we evaluate this energy expectation value using the samples from our network. And then we train the network such that we minimize the energy expectation value. And this immediately drives us towards um, the ground state representation because we represent the state with the lowest energy expectation value. So this is how we can train it if we are not given any kind of experimental data, but we are only given um, this Hamiltonian model. Uh, just as a side note, we can also combine the two methods. So this is something we did recently with my collaborators at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so here we looked at a two-dimensional qubit system. We had 16 by 16 qubits, and we evaluated the energy expectation value as a function of the training iterations of our recurrent neural network. And so training iteration means in every step, we update these variation parameters, so these connecting weights once. And now you see quite a lot going on in this plot. Um, so let me walk you through this. So we have an orange, the data-driven training behavior, meaning that this orange curve which goes along here uh, is really trained on, uh, it's trained on numerically generated uh, data simulating this um, qubit system that we looked at. And you see that, uh, well, if we start training, then this uh, energy expectation value goes down. Ideally, we want it to converge to this black dash line down here. So this is our exact energy that we have estimated numerically. And you see that, well, if we start training, we go towards this uh, exact energy, but at some point our curve runs away from the energy again. And this is a very famous phenomenon in machine learning methods. This is so-called overfitting, meaning that our data set on which we have trained the neural network does not contain enough information to really represent this uh, quantum state from which we have generated the data. And so we kind of represent some other quantum state, but not the one that we actually wanted to represent. Uh, in blue, you see the Hamiltonian-driven training. So this is where we minimize the energy expectation value. 
you see it goes down, it kind of converges towards this black dash line, but at the end, it's still pretty far away from this black dash line. And we will need to run this training process even longer to really converge to the ground state. And so what we did instead is we combined the two. So you see this in green here. So we started with training our network on data. So we used the data-driven training. And then at different points in time, we switched from data-driven to Hamiltonian-driven training. And the different shades of green here are just different times where we uh, switch between the two training algorithms. And what you see is that no matter where we switch, we always get immediately much closer to the exact energy than uh, we, we, uh, re or than we got with the individual training algorithms. So this shows us that we can use this limited amount of data, even if it does not contain enough information about the full quantum state, we can still use it just to enhance the performance of our Hamiltonian driven training. Okay, so this was all I wanted to tell you about how we can represent uh, quantum states with artificial neural networks. Now I hopefully still have a few minutes to talk about this last topic uh, of my research, uh, which is this spiking neuromorphic hardware. Um, and I told you, well, we want to use the spiking neuromorphic hardware ideally uh, in the same way as we use these artificial neural networks to look at quantum systems. So let me start with introducing spiking neurons in a little more detail. So spiking neurons are pretty different from these artificial neurons that I introduced earlier, but well, generally we can still denote them as just a circle and they are also connected to other neurons in the network. So they have these incoming synapses where they can receive signals sent out from connected neurons and they can also send out signals to other connected neurons via these outgoing synapses. And now the essential element of a spiking neuron is a membrane on which a potential is applied. And this potential evolves in time. And this is what's plotted here in blue. So we have uh, the evolution of this potential in time. And the behavior, is, um, or the behavior of this membrane potential is driven by the signals that the neuron receives on this incoming synapse. So other neurons in the network can influence this behavior of the membrane potential. Now, every time, time our uh, membrane potential crosses some threshold, as indicated in red here, our neuron performs a spike or it fires, and two things happen when a neuron uh, spikes. So first of all, the membrane potential is set to some refractory value, so it is fixed for a certain amount of time, and during this time, the neuron cannot spike again because our membrane potential is fixed, so we cannot cross the threshold. So we have kind of this refractory state for a certain amount of time, and at the same time, our neuron also sends out a signal on this outgoing synapse uh, to all other connected neurons. And with this, it influences um, the membrane potential of all other connected neurons. Uh, these connections, these synapses are weighted similarly to uh, the weight, connecting weights in our artificial neural networks. And so we can still um, train or vary these weighted connections um, to influence the behavior of our spiking neural network. The only big difference is that where these spikes are all the same, so the signals that are sent out, they are all the same in magnitude. Um, so the only way we can encode any kind of information is by using the spike times. So we really need to know when does a neuron spike and we can influence the timing of the, um, of the different spikes of the neurons via, these, via tuning these connecting weights. And with this, we can encode information just in the spike times. And so what we can do with our spiking neurons now is we can, inter uh, we can um, introduce a binary interpretation. So we have two states for our neurons, either our neuron uh, has just spiked and it is in this refractory state and it cannot spike again during this time, or it has not spiked, the membrane potential is evolving freely and it can spike at any point in time. And now you see here on the right, we have plotted uh, the behavior of four different neurons. So uh, these orange or these, these uh, horizontal lines are the different neurons. And then these orange bars are the times when a neuron spikes and the orange blocks are when, um, when the neuron is in this refractory state. And so now we can read out the neuron state by just checking if it is in the refractory state or not. So here, for example, if we look at the last moment in time, then the first two neurons are not refractory. So we say, okay, they are in this so-called zero state or the other two, they are refractory. So we, we say they are in the one state. And so we have a binary interpretation of our neurons. And we can read out these neuron configurations at uh, different points in time. Right? So this is what we do here. So at different points in time, we just check if each neuron is refractory or not. And I just realized that I'm randomly switching between minus one and one and zero and one. So this is all the same. So whenever I write minus one, it's the same as when it's zero. Um, so we can read out these neuron configurations in time. And these neuron configurations follow some underlying probability distribution. 
So we can kind of interpret these neural configurations that we read out as samples from an underlying probability distribution. And we can tune this probability distribution again, similarly to the artificial neural networks by tuning the connecting weights. And so this way we can approximate these generative artificial neural network models. So we can approximate artificial neural networks that can encode probability distributions and generate samples from it. And uh, so this uh, has been proven by Mihai Petkovici. So he was a, a, yeah, a great student working on this brainscape strip, which developed at Heidelberg University in Germany. And he has really shown that you can use these spiking neural networks to really approximate different kinds of um, artificial neural networks that encode probability distributions and generate samples from it. And so now we have all our ingredients. So we have seen that we can, um, can use our spiking neural models hardware to approximate uh, generative artificial neural networks. I've shown you earlier how we can use generative artificial neural networks to approximate or to reconstruct quantum states. So now we can put it all together and we can use the spiking neuromorphic hardware to reconstruct quantum states. And this is something we did uh, when I was still back at Heidelberg University, where I also did my PhD. Um, we really used their uh, hardware that was developed there, and we wanted, to, we wanted to use it to represent quantum states. And so what we did is we took the hardware, we uh, chose to, or we set it up in the correct setting, meaning we, inter uh, we interpreted some of the neurons as visible or input neurons, others as hidden neurons. And then we were reading out the neuron configurations at different points in time. And we wanted to interpret them as a probability distribution representing a quantum state. Uh, we had to take an extra step here. So we had to represent our quantum state in this so-called positive operator value measure uh, representation. Again, I don't have time to go into detail here, but basically what this thing does, it allows us to represent our quantum state completely in terms of a real valued probability distribution. So we don't need to care about complex cases in the wave function or anything. We can just use this representation and we have all the information encoded in a probability distribution. And then we can interpret our neuron samples accordingly and we can generate such a histogram uh, which follows the underlying probability distribution. And we can train our network such that this histogram represents the square wave function absolute or the quantum state in this POVM representation. And so this is what we did. And we started pretty basic. So we started with looking at the Bell state. Uh, you have seen this earlier. This was this fully entangled state where we have two qubits being in the, either both in, this, in the down or both in the up state. And so the interesting thing is that this is a very small system size, but it shows strong entanglement. And so our motivation was to see if we can capture this strong entanglement in the representation on the spiking neuromorphic hardware. And so we trained our hardware and what I'm plotting down here now is the fidelity. So this is kind of the overlap between the um, original or the, um, the, the exact uh, bell state and the state reconstructed on the spiking neuromorphic hardware. So if this is one, we know that the states are entirely equal. So we want it to be as close to one as possible. And now you see here in blue, this is our bell state. This is the fidelity between the exact and the reconstructed state as a function of the number of hidden neurons in our network. So if we increase the number of hidden neurons, we have more connecting weights, meaning we have more degrees of freedom that we can tune. So we increase the expressivity of our network when we increase the number of hidden neurons. And this is exactly what we see here. So the fidelity increases when we increase the number of hidden neurons. It converges pretty close to one. So this was really remarkable. So we had a really pretty accurate uh, representation of the Bell state on our classical analog hardware. And what I found even more remarkable is that if you look at this gray dash line here, this line shows that whenever we are above this, this line, we have quantum entanglement present in our state. So we really capture this strong entanglement in this representation of the quantum state on this classical analog hardware. And I was really impressed when I saw this result. I was saying, okay, so this is an analog hardware. It's just an electronic circuit and it can capture quantum entanglement. So for the belt state, everything was really exciting and looked really good. And so we said, well, belt state is kind of boring. So let's go to larger system sizes. And we looked at the Greenberger Horn Seilinger state, which is pretty much the same as the belt state. So also the equal position of uh, the all down and all up state, but for more than two qubits. And so we looked at three qubits in orange here. We have again our uh, fidelity. We also looked at four qubits in green. And you see that the fidelity is much lower, which is kind of expected because we have more qubits. So we probably need more hidden neurons to accurately reconstruct the state. Uh, but we also see that definitely the uh, fidelity increases with the number of hidden neurons. So this looks all good, but then we stopped at slightly less than 60 hidden neurons. 
and we did not stop because we are satisfied because these results are obviously not satisfying. But what we did here is we were using all the neurons that were present on our neuromorphic chip. And so what we saw is that well, we can reconstruct quantum states with the spiking neuromorphic hardware. It works extremely well, but the current chip sizes limit us to extremely small distance sizes. And when I talk about extremely small distance sizes, I'm talking about two qubits. So this is, yeah, not that satisfying. And, but on the other hand, it shows us that it's extremely powerful. So what we were able to do here, we were able to sample uh, neuron configurations every 12 microseconds. So if you compare this to sampling from a probability distribution on your classical computer, this is extremely fast. And also comparing it to uh, implementations on our classical machines, we reduce the energy, energy consumption by a factor of 100, which is also really impressive. And if we think about scaling things up to large qubit systems, then this is definitely something that can help us a lot. But on the other hand, we still need to work on improving our algorithm and uh, yeah, finding a way to actually go to larger system sizes. So with this, I'm at the end of my talk. So let me quickly summarize. I have shown you that artificial neural networks can efficiently represent quantum states. Uh, they, are, they are really good at this. Uh, we can use this spike neuromorphic hardware to make things faster and also more energy efficient. Um, and with all these approximative studies of our quantum systems or qubit systems, we can get more um, insights into their behavior and we can learn to control them. And with this, um, yeah, advance the field of quantum computation and quantum simulation. But we have also seen that there are still a lot to improve um, on these, uh, on both sides, or so on the neural, artificial neural networks and especially on the neuromorphic hardware side. And this is what I'm now doing with my group in uh, Ottawa. So these are my current students. The group is called Apricot. And we have seen there's still a lot to explore. You also see the group is pretty small currently. So there's a lot of space for more students. So if you're interested in all this, uh, feel free to reach out. And yeah, with this, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any kind of questions. So the question is if, the, uh, if there's any way to know how the number of necessary hidden neurons scales with the system size and whether it scales exponentially, which would just mean, okay, we didn't gain anything because then we could also just look at the system uh, exactly. Um, or yeah, if we uh, or if it can scale uh, polynomially or linearly, ideally. Uh, so this is a point that is not that well understood these days. So, well, yeah, you re we really don't have any idea about how the number or the necessary number of hidden neurons scales with the system size. It totally depends on your quantum state, obviously. So there exist states where it has been shown that you don't need that many hidden neurons to represent them. There exist states where people have shown that well. It does scale exponentially, like the number does scale exponentially, um, but it is not well understood what defined or what influences this behavior. So you definitely can gain something for a specific kind of states. For others, it's not clear if you gain something by using this method. Yeah, the question was about the device I'm using. Um, so yeah, it looks like this. <laughs> so this is the, the chip we are using. Um, so it's, a, it's an electronic circuit which, which emulates the behavior of a biological neuron. Okay, so it's not an, a biological neuron itself. It's just an electronic circuit. And of course, it does not have the exact structure, structure as a biological neuron. Uh, on the one hand, because a biological neuron is extremely complex. On the other hand, because it is barely understood how it actually works. But these models that are used here, it's the so-called leaky integrated fire model, um, they are pretty close approximations to biological neurons. And they have this benefit that, that they can efficiently be represented in these electronic circuits. So this makes things efficient, more efficient because these uh, electronic circuits just do all these nonlinear transformations and all the behavior for you. So you don't need to do it on your classical machine and evaluate all these differential uh, equations. You can just run your electronic circuit and it simulates or it solves these uh, differential equations immediately. So I guess the follow up question is you say that you have an advantage that you save energy by a factor of 100. Yeah. Is this kind of uh, because of the hardware or because the hardware, the hardware to operate in this sort of parallel like fashion that therefore cuts down the number of operations? Right. Um, yeah. So, so this energy, uh, energy reduction. Well, on the one hand, it's because of the hardware, because we have this, these very small chips with electronic circuits, which need less energy than running this full computer. Um, on the other hand, um, yeah, it's, so I think when we made this comparison, it was also about comparing it to solving these differential equations on our classical machines. 
um, which of course takes much more energy and also much more effort than if we just run or if we just use the physics that exists and, uh, and which does naturally. Yeah. I have a follow up just yep. related to that. So um, you're making electronic models of, of a brain, trying to mimic the way a brain works. Is there any research that the public on using brain, like artificial brains oh, artificial. themselves? Um, not to my knowledge. I'm not sure, actually. Is there, is there a if we could do that, would that be an advantage to this or would that not work the same way as making an electronic brain? Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a really great question. Yeah, so I'm actually not too sure if there is something like an artificial brain in the biological sense, because again, this, the, like the model of the brain that we have is a very simplified model. No one really knows what exactly is going on in the brain. Uh, it's not that well understood. So I'm not sure if you have really biological artificial brains. Um, but then also, if you had them, you would need to control them in a specific way, right? So here we know exactly what we are doing. So we can control it in a way such that we approximate these um, artificial neural networks. If you have an actual model of the brain, I don't think it is that easy to control it in a good way. Okay, thanks. So other yeah, um, so I don't have the greatest background, so this might be a dumb question. But um, when you're talking about using the uh, neural spike in order to kind of create an approximation of the neural network, which would then create an approximation of the actual part of the system, would that mean that your spike gain hardware would be kind of less accurate, I suppose, than the neural method, but it's so much more effective? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, so this was definitely less accurate. You have more noise effect because just because it's an experimental setup. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's an approximation of the artificial neural network. So this again makes it worse. Um, but I also think that this approach that we chose here using this spiking neuromorphic hardware to or enforce it to have this behavior of an artificial neural network to then do something with it. I think this was just not the best approach, um, which is also why it is so limited now. Uh, so this is something I'm planning to explore with my students to find more natural representation of quantum states on spiking neuromorphic hardware. Go ahead. Last question. Uh, so when you talk about the neuromorphic chip, so like uh, like conventional computing, it's getting harder for us to make smaller and smaller chips. What is the limiting factor on the size of the neuromorphic chip? Is there like architectural limitations in terms of how many you can put together, or is it a manufacturing problem of just building chips that are large enough to have right. more, more neurons? Um, so I think the, the limiting factor is really the amount of neurons that you can have on the chip because at some point, uh, yeah. okay, I, I don't know the details about the electronic circuit, but, but um, at some point you reach the limitations of. Um, I think you, you lose a, a lot of accuracy if you make it larger. And I think there's also some problem with the energy consumption on the chip and stuff. But so what they do is basically they have, like this is a single chip. You can put multiple of them together and with this increase it. So you can make like wafers of, of these chips and you can also stack these wafers. So you can make them pretty huge. But then again, all these chips have to be uh, calibrated individually. It's an experimental setup. I spent quite a lot of time calibrating one chip. I don't want to do it for like a waiver of chips. So, <laughs> so I think this is the current limitation of them. Yeah. You mentioned 60 neurons on a chip is what I understood. Um, is the chip one layer? Is there a cost benefit analysis to adding neurons versus adding layers? Right. Um, yeah, so, okay. So first of all, I was talking about 60 neurons, which is not the full truth. So the full chip has, I'm not sure it's either 128 or 256 neurons. So there's more, more than um, 60 neurons, but you have to keep in mind that if we just run our chip, we have a, um, we have a deterministic model. So we, if we just run our chip, we know exactly when each neuron is supposed to spike if given the initial conditions. So there's no, uh, no natural stochastic behavior. And so we had to add so-called noise neurons, which were just spiking at random points in time. And with this generated some noise so that we really sample from a probability distribution when we read out the neural configurations. And then we figured out that in order to really have good noise, we need 
quite a huge amount of noise neurons. So this was the rest of all the neurons that we could not use them because they were noise neurons. Um, and then to the limiting factor, yeah, as I mentioned, so this was just really just one chip. So we were using all these uh, 128 or 256 neurons. Um, again, we can connect it to another chip. We need to calibrate it, but it also makes the performance worse because any kind of external connection always makes things lower and uh, also yeah, more expensive energy-wise. And so we could go to, la to larger systems and to these wafers, but for now it's easier to just uh, stay with one and see what we can do with it. Okay, maybe a last uh, question, a bird's eye view question. Uh, how small is the community of researchers for studying neuromorphic hardware? For simulating quantum systems and oh, yeah. <laughs> related, like how do you see that community evolving over the next five years? Right. Um, so the community on this very specific field is pretty small. So like the community on neuromorphic hardware is, is growing and it's already pretty big. But connecting this neuromorphic hardware with quantum, the community is pretty small. Um, I would think I was like, during my PhD, I was kind of a pioneer looking into this. So this was definitely the work I was showing you was definitely the first work where we really used a neuromorphic chip uh, to represent quantum states. Um, in the beginning, it was also, so I was working on this because I was interested in it. I also realized that other people were not that interested. So it was kind of uh, a bit lonely in the beginning. But over the last years, I really realized that people are getting interested in this field. And I'm, I'm seeing the field grow and I see more and more people looking into the topic and yeah, also asking me on how it works. And so I think the community is definitely growing and it's, it's a really, it's a field that will come up in the next years. Okay, and, and, and one more follow-up and you probably mentioned this, are you, uh, are you recruiting graduate students right now yeah. for your program? Yeah, I am, yeah. So I have, yeah, graduate students also position or yeah, research projects for undergrads. Uh, yeah, my group is still growing. It's still starting or it has just started. So there's, a lot of space for new students, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you, uh, thank you. As I said before, uh, I'm Jesse Heilman, uh, the regional coordinator for uh, this 2023 Cap Lecture Tour Series um, event. And at this time, uh, I would like to thank the national coordinator, Professor Gwen Grenier, uh, the staff in the Cap office, the university coordinator, and our host, Professor Aaron Slepkov, for helping to organize today's talk. Um, oh, thank you uh, to Dr. Stephanie Zizek uh, for an excellent presentation, uh, and thank you all for participating. Uh, thank you to the CAP Foundation and its generous donors who have made the CAP Lecture Tour possible. Uh, please consider making a charitable donation today to support the program and many others. Uh, the fourth talk uh, will be by Professor Els Peters on Thursday, March 2nd at 3.30 Eastern Time. Uh, who will speak on the exciting new science of the James Webb Space Telescope. Have a great day and thank you very much.